Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of the Law Firm Blueprint. I'm one of your host, Jay Ruiz, CEO of the Mastermind, the Criminal Mastermind, uh, as well as Ruane Attorneys, a criminal defense firm in Connecticut. With me, as always, my man, Seth Price, down there, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and South Carolina, as well as Grand Poobah of all things Blue Shark Digital. Thank you for being with us this week. And Seth, I got a lot on my mind. I know you got a lot on your mind. Let's jump right into it. How's your week going? It's going good. Uh, we made uh, made a nice sea level higher, uh, which finally means that I feel like my whole team is in place. Now it's tweaking. Uh, we we had a, a lawyer who was not performing at like ideal standards. We were like upgrading things now, which is a nice, like, you know, as you know, we very often wait for either something so bad that we have to fire or are waiting just for somebody to break and leave on their own. And, right. you know, when, again, in law firm growth, we've all been there. We've all kept people longer than we should have because we can't live without them. And that knowing that when you, you know, one of the things I think you 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 strive to get to is the point where somebody would be better off in another place for themselves and for you and making sure that you identify that rather than waiting for that to break. Yeah, for sure. You know, speaking of that topic of, of um, having the right person in the right seat and and that type of thing. I want to talk to you a little bit about bandwidth and actually filling that seat. You know, I, I've discussed this frequently that, you know, I have a lawyer salesperson, an intake lawyer who closes all of our business. I think in the context of criminal work, it's very helpful to have somebody who can answer those questions. Um, it, you know, we're, we're not doing PI, we're not doing, you know, other immigration, other areas of law that seem better suited to non-attorney sales. Uh, well, and look, and we just full disclosure, we've talked about a lot. We have never had that. We're actually trying to figure out how to bring a lawyer into that fold. So I think it's genius. Well, I mean, think about it though. You, but you have your lawyers close their own business. Correct. But right. know, that if I have 22 criminal lawyers, that means I have a 22nd worst closer. Oh, I absolutely. I, okay. I, I, I so agree. Being, with you. My first five, I'm loving it because they're doing seven figures. My, 22nd is leaving how much on the table right and and one of the things one of the issues that you have in all law firms i think where you are doing fee for service is that if you have lawyers doing the selling for you like for example if you you break down people geographically or by you know by subject matter and they are getting a straight salary you know you're asking right. them and to close not, business you know. no right, right. You, so assuming that you're fully incentivizing the person to do it right but my question then becomes, I have a sales lawyer now. That sales lawyer, you know, has a solid week where they are able to do the work, but they are not overworked. Um, but they, they that that's their job, right? And they make great money doing the sales lawyer. I don't really think I can afford another sales lawyer. And I don't need it because I don't, I'm not at a point where I have the 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 need for two full-time sales lawyers. So how do you fill that role when the sales lawyer says, hey, man, I want to take a two-week vacation? So like right now it's well, falling I, into my lap where I'm stepping up. Or like you. this weekend, my kids got me sick, and now I'm home, and I'm, I'm, I'm throwing up, and I can't answer those calls on a Monday and, and be the person. What do you do in that situation? Okay. Do you so look, I, there are two things going on. We're going to talk about them both, right, since, we, since we, we should lay it out so it forces us to come back to it. The first is the question of – what do you do as a growing law firm, whether you're a solo, three people, 20 people, 100 people? Right. How do you deal with the idea that there's a person doing one job, one widget, that if they're not there, what happens? Or right. they quit or what have you, that risk, right? This person. And the second is, should you be at your size adding additional bandwidth for that? And that I know I went from pre-COVID 12 people in office to 24, 25, including diversified international and domestic. I know that every time I've added a person in intake, and that's not even closing people, I make more money, right? So that it's one of those areas that if you know how to do this and could replicate it, to me, like, okay, you say, let's say you would be paying a new person, let's just use the number 100,000 over under. Right, eighty, whatever it is, eighty, hundred, hundred thousand, with incentives. Let's say it's a hundred. So if you say, "Oh my God, that's so much money," okay, what if you did three months at twenty-five thousand? Could you tell in three months if you're making more money? And sure. hypothetically, if your top, if your top line gross revenue went up at least seventy-five thousand in that three-month period, 
that which is not crazy, right? You're basically saying, can this person raise me twenty five thousand a month? You know, if they can, great. If they can't, but let's say they get close, I'm making this up. So it's not like a home run. It's like right. just shy of three to one, but it buys you insulation if that person quits, if they're on vacation. Right now, history is written by the victor. You've had this person how long? 10 years? 20. 20 years. That's your secret. It's, that's your unicorn, your secret sauce. God right. bless you. I'm thankful for it. But history is written by the victor. If she had left you seven years ago and you were spinning through people, you'd be less set. So I think that, and it goes, let's go back to the other piece, which we talk about with people, because we've both been there, we're still there. There are times when you have one, we've talked years ago, like about, should you have an attorney first or a paralegal first and all of that? The question is, if you don't have some redundancy, then, you know, you're just waiting for something to break and it's you. You are that extra piece. You always talk about being out of the business. You're not if you have a one-person department for the time being. And you know what? Yeah. Plan right. B may be this lawyer would step in if they're not in court. And you could have a plan B. But at the end of the day, for the foreseeable future, you're the backstop unless you staff appropriately. Right. And that's and that's one of the things. Like, I mean, I think to hire I, – I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think – Finding the talent for the sales lawyer position is also extremely difficult, extremely difficult because it's not something that comes naturally to most lawyers. Uh, right. You know? And, you know, so we have one, our first one, full disclosure, we talk about it, have somebody in training. I talk about the rule of threes. Let's God willing, it's not this one. Right. Because you sort of, you don't, you don't know what you don't know. You're trying to figure this out. How do you make it happen? All right. of that said, um, you know, when I think about this, and it's the 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 idea that it, it, you could take the Giants. I know you're a Jets fan, but the Giants historically have had best player on the board is who you take, right? Whether you need it or not within reason. Right. And so if you find somebody, should you be grabbing it? Because with those salespeople, not only do you have to find somebody who's theoretically a lawyer if you're going the lawyer route, but you have to have somebody that you can live with. Sales, as I know from both Blue Shark and from this new position, it, there are a lot of people that can sell, but you may not love hanging around them. Salespeople are a different ethos to everything else. I interviewed a guy who was amazing. You would say, oh my God, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But if there's other things in their, their persona or their background that don't align, you know, it's such a, it's such a unicorn that you could find that would hit that particular thing. So that to me, that's one of the reasons why I love recruiting in the sense that if I could find that person, I know that if you had another rock star, you'd make more money. Yeah, I, I, pr I probably would. I mean, and then that that le leads to the next question, where do you go to find that sales lawyer? Because if you put that out, you know, you can say, are you, you know, do you have a background in sales and thought law was for you, but really are now 10 years into it and you hate it? Do you look for, I mean, I mean, unfortunately in, in my world, I know, I know a good dozen disbarred lawyers who are now sitting at home with nothing to do. And I can make them well, a well, salesperson. They have the knowledge. They're not attorney salespeople. Again, nothing wrong with it. But right. Is that something that I should investigate? Um, but there are people that do that. And also next to the world, we had a guy for years who was sort of like uh, a doctor that would vet medical cases for us instantaneously, med mal cases. Yeah, he had had a run in with the bar of medicine and, you know, yeah. there are all those pieces. So, look, I, I've been through it. Like, I'm like, you want to know? Uh, you put your th stuff on LinkedIn, you put on the list, local listservs. And what I was seeing is two out of three were essentially people who wanted to stop working. That's the problem. They're like, yeah, because yeah, if, if they don't want to work. They, they they want to change, but exactly. they don't necessarily want to work. Correct. And the, look, I, one guy was great. He came from a, a, a local, I don't want to call it competitor, but somebody in the same space in Virginia and would have been awesome and then ghosted us. My point is like, so it's like meaning the people, it's sort of like dating. The girls that I wanted didn't want me and vice versa. Woody Allen, Groucho Marx, why would you ever remember right. a club that he was a member? Um, I, I would say that it's the fundamentals. You know what it is. Like you, nobody's a better in a bad way, in a good way, a self-promoter than you. You go to freaking bar association events, you know, in in garb with a booth. I mean, not just a booth, but like a, you know, you yeah, know how to attract, bar association. You know how to attract attention. 
So it's really a question of have you raised your hand to the world? First, let your person know that you are looking for an additional, not a replacement. I say that because my my tennis club just had a whole brouhaha, first world issue. But yeah, I mean, seriously. Understood. I took it's my middle aged sport. The only reason I'm still ticking, keeping my weight down as best I can. You're not um, a pickleballer? Not yet. I, I my tennis is so marginal. And I'm told that when you play pickleball, it hurts your tennis game. I have nothing to give. Right. So, I, so, so now it's time to switch. Well, I, well, I'll save that for Florida. I do enjoy the pickleball, but tennis really burns a sweat and gets my, you know, I need to keep it as long as I can. But the board hire a recruiter to hire a general manager. And there have been a director there for like 20 years, you know, who's beloved. And the recruiter used the club name in the ad. So a note to everybody out there. Anything you post, even when it doesn't say the name of your firm, can be traced back. So first right. thing is, given that you want additional bandwidth, you say, hey, I want you to be able to take vacation. I want to expand the department, give you somebody to supervise. First disclose, right, when you can. And then secondly, like, like the answer is there's not a, you know, you can't go to the 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 attorney intake lawyer farm and like grab, you know, a cat. Well, and that's and that's one of the things that most of the people in our audience are not in major metropolitan areas where people relocate to. I mean, you're you're, you know, D.C., Maryland, Virginia. There are people in Dallas and in, uh, you know, in Austin or Atlanta or Chicago or New York City. I'm talking about suburban Connecticut. I mean, we're talking maybe 300 okay. criminal defense lawyers in the state that know what okay. they're talking about. Okay, so so, look, so this, my, I'm my pool is small. Why not get, like, you, you theoretically, how long does it take to wave into Connecticut? Uh, I mean, fewer than six months, I think. I mean, it's just... So it may be that uh, you, you, you make the hire and you wave them in, you know? You... Yeah, but then at that point, they don't have the knowledge of the courthouses and stuff. No, but okay, that's what it seems people are asking about on the call. Understood, understood. But I mean, if I need to train somebody, why wouldn't I train a non-attorney salesperson in all of that information? Well, yes, because you have the bar and they can actually do, they can go a step further than that. And I think there is something to saying I'm a barred attorney, but put that aside for a right. second. Um, yes, good question. You can get 90% of it potentially, but I think the same issue is there. When somebody starts, they're not going to price a homicide for you. Not that you do them, but I'm making that up. Serious right. felony, right? Anything right. with hair on it, isn't going to be done by that person. They're coming to your, your attorney, even your senior attorney comes to you, right? It talks it through. So what you're talking about is your speeding tickets, your misdemeanors, your DUIs, all of that. If the person is with it, you're going to be able to get them up to speed in a matter of weeks, if not days. Sure. You know, it's so, then, so then here comes my next throw, curveball, actually. It's something that we didn't talk pre-show, but like, you know, I'm seeing, you know, exit signs on the ramp, you know, coming up uh, down the line. I'd like to get out, you know, nine more years and be able to exit this business. And one of the things that I'm thinking of is, you know, I need to train my lawyers here to essentially buy the firm for me. I don't think it's going to be able to be sold on the open market, but I would be able to sell it to some extent to my existing attorneys if they want to continue their income and you know they've got the marketing in place and all that fine funky stuff and the staff to be able to support it so should i start looking at my lawyers and say hey look i've got a half a dozen more than that of, of you guys why don't i teach you guys you know to do a year on intake and sales do a year on marketing do a year on administration so that after three or four years you're in a position where you can help run this firm and and you may be interested in buying it and i can give you a nice price and uh, and, and exit? Should I be looking to, or should I just be having those lawyers grind? Well, look, I don't think it's an either or. Let's let's divide it again, right? So on the one hand, I'm all for having the attorneys part of these different pieces so they can be more essential. I can tell you, I know the PI firms sell, they say two to four X, and I know extraordinary FU firms in the market may go four, maybe even the average firm, if you're lucky, you're getting three times EBITDA, right? Okay. Profits, right? If you're lucky. And given that we're not in PI, if you get two, that's probably the over-under. Nobody talks about it, but I know I know there's some brokers. But I think that's something that, you know, it'd be interesting but, in this age of boomers, people leaving, you know, how how firms are valuing themselves for sale or if people are just walking away and letting the people, people behind them. a guy them. in one of our masterminds has, has a modest size PI practice. 
And he told me about it, this great deal. He had his associate lined up to do it. I was like, that deal's way too good to be true. The moment somebody looks at this deal, nobody's doing your deal. So it's sad. And one of the realities of this world, in my, from my take right now, non-attorney ownership may change that. But what I see right now is you just need to set something up where you can be on the beach nine months out of the year and check in for this or that. You're not like the odds of you, the amount of work it would take and the luck and the timing, and you're going to give it to four people, the odds of them getting along in nine years, the odds of them being there, like build some, build something to last, right? Build the right business and you'll either be able to extract yourself mostly, right? It's not crazy. Yeah. But the idea that you're going to like sit there and, and like you do all this work because you are hoping and look, what history is written by the victor. One out of seven. Yes. Somebody sits there and writes a primary show gets a loan from a bank. Like the truth is you're getting some percentage on revenue for a period of time. Sure. You're not nobody's going to a bank to buy your thing. No, I, I don't think they are. I mean, I mean, shit, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe the best thing to do is just structure this thing for non-attorney ownership. And and when I truly exit, you know, cons my kids could take over as non-attorneys. And, and well, maybe want to be an attorney, God forbid. But uh, I try to talk them out of that. That's for sure. Or just have at least the JD. So, right. but like that, all of that is, or as long as you're alive, you'll right. you know you, you're there as, as the conduit to them running it and look that's not uncommon that is you know somebody runs it as a business and yeah they're, they're and you hire a coo and and, it's, and you have all the people in place and so you don't really have to be involved that much i mean right. shit, and I look, knew. that's what i'm seeing is that as we add a real executive team as that org chart fills out you're able to and again it's fine until it's not fine but with a real executive team, you can do some serious damage and create some breathing room between you and, you know, the, meaning, but the idea that you're doing all this for a potential sale in nine years of people that may or may not be willing, like, I hope they're all with you. Right. And I think you should, and I think you should, on the other hand, continue to invest in them and teach them these things. And, and if you want to put profit sharing in place and do things like that, great. But this idea that you're that the, that right now, out of all the people we know, outside of some mega firms, how many have had a successful sale? I don't know. That's the that's the really big question because it's not something that people talk about in our industry. They don't. And we've had we had a guest on who was a broker of them, and there's like one guy out there. You would right. think if there was a lot of business in this space, there'd be a bunch of them. I just met somebody at Legal Tech. She's starting to do do something in this space. And look, does something sell every once in a while? I'm sure it does. Yeah. Is it is it pretty modest? Because think about it. If somebody comes along, look, I've looked at this. Should I buy somebody's practice? What's it worth? And at the end of the day, all I'm buying is a digital marketing asset for me. If I can build it cheaper myself, why shouldn't I do that? Or if pay right. I mean yeah, I mean that's that's the that's the thing. I mean, you got to look to see what they're actually selling. I know with me, you know, my mailing list has value. I'm getting cases from it. My my digital footprint has value to people. I'd hate for that stuff to just disappear. But I guess you know, hey, you know, no, it, it won't. Of course, Blockbuster went out of business too. Like, I mean, but it's, I thought you're going to go out of business. But like, look, first, as long as you are ticking, you could have somebody else. You could minimize your involvement. Right. Right. Assuming that it's so that I think is your retirement. You don't want to acknowledge it, but your retirement is you figure out a way you invest in enough C level people that there's an ops person, the accounting, the marketing, the buy, whatever it is, that all of those things are being done by people that share your sensibility. Um, you you know, for you, you're you're on a uh, you could do a weekly call with them, do an L10 if you're using EOS, but the yep. idea that you're gonna just you know, to me, that's a longer tail. That yeah, I mean, will... think about it. I mean, really, what's stopping me from doing that and putting that into place uh, February 27th, 2024? Partially, I mean, will, will you make the right investments right. to do that? A, are you willing to step out? For years, you weren't willing to get out of the courtroom. Great. Right. You know, is it something that is stable enough that you could do it? Or how much J. Ruane spit and glue is holding the pieces together as opposed to if it's arm's length and you're not there, you know, what happens when somebody quits? Does, does your life stop or do you have people right. that know how to do this? And if you haven't invested in that extra bandwidth, that's a pretty telltale sign that your leverage, that your salary 
or your take home includes the fact there's not a second backup intake person. Yeah. I mean, it, this is a long way to get to this, the, to the, the, the conversation that we, we started landed with. The plane. We landed the plane. So what do you got going on? What's, what's your issue? You know what, so all the, so the limited time we have left, I would say what I've been doing a lot of thinking about is, you know, we look back and it was done on the show, January 21, we diversified with international labor. It's been a game changer for our intake right now. Our intake is at a golden period. I shouldn't even say it aloud. Our director is great. We have, we have, a, we have a lawyer in the, we just, stuff is going really well. It's glass, but I'm knocking on it. Knocking on. That said, what we always see is you want to keep and retain great people. And the people at the top, like once you have a C team, you know, they come in at one number, but if you're, if they're jamming and they see the success and everything else, you have to make sure they continue to be incentivized top of the game. You want to take money out of it as best you can. Yeah, and for sure. One of the things that I've been looking at as we've added new people is looking at each department and making sure that what needs to be done locally is done locally, what could be done domestically is done domestically, and what could be done internationally is done internationally. And it's an ugly discussion because I don't want to be like, hey, I'm outsourcing jobs. But what I would like to do is have a reasonable number of really well-paid jobs locally, but knowing the piece that I struggle with, and the account, our accounting department is a great example, that we had um, a lot of turnover at the, at the mid-level, the junior level, because in our market, forty to $65,000 for a not for established person who has a family is not really above water. Uh, right. you know, so let's say we were paying people 50, 55, 60 in jobs that they come, but there was no longevity. There was, I mean, it wasn't even enough to get to a raise point. It was just that the salary that they asked for and were getting before they came to us was one that was not sustainable for life here. And that whatever it was, like, it's not like it's below the poverty line, but it's not going to allow for a state, what your one medical issue away from being thrown off your one, you know, d divorce, whatever it is, there's always whatever right. happens throws that off. And that we were. And so that what I'm trying to figure out is how, which I'm going to do, I think we're doing a pretty good job of is making sure and being diligent that the people I want to pay six figures aren't sitting on tasks they shouldn't be doing. And that to me has been one of the bigger breakthroughs. So it's not just like, hey, I'm a firm of all VAs, that's complete shit. Right. But it's a team that is layering what needs to be done. And part of it takes time and comfort is that as you find some of the rock stars, that you keep them, retain them, and pay them internationally numbers. Because when you get to the point where there's somebody where you can't tell where they are across border, that's when you can really start to jam where you're paying. Yeah a very high salary for that country, not just an okay one, but a FU salary there, which is substantially less than here. And that intersection is what I, you know, you, you strive for and push for. Well, you know, you, you talk about that. I mean, right now, the dollar versus the Argentinian peso is like amazing because the country's going through like tremendous financial problems. And I, I've talked to, you know, some of my people who there are there and they're like, we're the richest people on the planet right now. Because we, you know, we we're getting paid and and in we have worked in in American dollars, right. and uh, and and even though it's you know below minimum wage here in the U.S., you know, in my state, for them, I mean, like the, one one of my guys is like, I I take a flight every weekend and go on vacation. He's like, I'm going, I'm staying at five star hotels every weekend because I can afford it. And I love this job because it allows me to do that. He's like, and everybody's jealous of me and they want to know where I work. I won't tell them. And I, because I, I don't want other people sending in a resume and trying to undercut me. Well, it's like, time out, time out. That, that, I want to see, I want that flipped. I don't like that. So I love the fact he's happy, but our best recruiting source are our people. Oh, this is, and, this is one kid. He's 22. No, no, no. What I'm saying is good. So, okay. Give him $500 for each rock star he brings in. It's 250 for a hire. And if they stay a year, I, you know, give him a reason to do more because what you want is more of that. And he likely hangs out with those people. So oh, to totally. Me, yeah. I, I, I flip that all on its head. To me, I want the opposite. I want people saying, how do I get more of you? Our best, some of our best hires come from internal referrals. Oh, yeah. I mean, really, all of my internal uh, international hires now 
our referrals. I mean, right. we're not even putting our ads. But, but if you could take, if you can go first class on that weekend flight because of you, then you'll have them. That's awesome. So let me ask you this. How do you deal with when, when you have direct international people working for you? How do you deal with things like maternity leave? You know, at this point, it's all feeling out. And I literally today was crowdsourcing how Blue Shark was dealing with versus Price Benowitz because there are things that we started with we're like, hey, we'll just pay above market and we'll be good. And then stuff came. We recently had the issue, which we're st- currently trying to figure out, is we we don't love the idea that the, you, our office is closed and somebody else can't make a de- paycheck that day. It's not a great ethos. So one of the things that they've heard is, you know, making sure, you know, Christmas, New Year's paid and then other things along those lines uh, that we sort of is with time adding flex days, uh, and eventually, you know, full, full, full paid time off. Um, it's it's interesting because we've talked about this way, way back on the show, which is, do you push your benefits up or do you put every dollar you have into salary? And with each time I say, hey, do you want to add this to the mix? Way back when we when I started, we didn't have health care. It was pre-Obamacare. And we would just tell people, hey, you're healthy. Go take take a few hundred dollars cash and, and go buy whatever you want. We'll pay for 100 percent. No copay. Just buy the because our people were young and they could get cheap insurance. Obamacare made it so that you could get it for everybody right. with pre existing conditions, et cetera. So what I would say is I think with each of these, are you are they contractors? In, yes. in, which is what they are, right? So if they're contractors, in theory, here's your dollar. If you're not working, you're not getting something versus, hey, you've been with us for a while. We don't want you to feel like second class citizens. And that's the pull and tug because I'm convinced. And But there was an issue. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to sort of um, put it out there where people were asking for something. Not My team was asking on behalf of our contractors. And I was like, what, what does that cost? And the truth was, let's say I'm making this up. Let's say it was 30 cents an hour. Right. Not a tremendous amount, but not nothing across the board right. for what's 35, 40 people now. And so my attitude is, if you think the 30, that, that th- a 30 cent an hour raise is, you know, that, that again, if it's 30 cents, who cares? But like right. when it gets 50 cents to a dollar, would something, let's say it's a 50 cents or a dollar hour raise, which would you rather have? I'm asking that rhetorically. And so I think that as business owners, we're always trying to figure that out. Will somebody leave you for defective benefits versus salary how often when you've lost people how often is it because they got a higher paycheck somewhere else versus better they get uh long-term disability or life insurance or burial insurance whatever it is how often do you lose somebody because of that that's interesting because we try to give like mercedes-benz gold level benefits we give them 401k, life insurance, long-term disability, short-term disability. We give them long-term care insurance. Uh, we have a group policy uh, that they get. And then when they leave, they can spin that off into their own long-term care insurance. It's, it's amazing. A only had, That's a big deal. It's a huge deal. And the, the reason why we got it was because my father was older and I could package him into a group with a bunch of young employees and it made it financially possible for him to be able to get long-term care insurance uh, for him and my mother through that, through a spousal program that we weren't otherwise able to get just on the open market at a reasonable price. Uh, and you know, what's crazy is that only one person has kept the long-term care insurance when they left me. Um, everybody else has just foregone that that uh, benefit. Um, the, the, well, but, okay, probably but, the, one of the smartest lawyers I've ever had worked for me is the one who kept it. Right. Uh, even though so she I'm, works for the state so government. I, I, I'll tell you, total aside, we got to get out of this. But um, I actually got the opportunity to buy, my law partner made fun of me. I asked when I turned 30, his dad and brothers in the insurance business, how do I get long-term care? And they sort of laughed because they don't even write it till you're 40. Um, right. You know, for a person, I'm sure with a group it was different. And um there was a company, uh, Trans America or something, was going out of business. Was not going out of business. They were writing one-time pay. So at age forty, I was able to get insurance that's done. Whereas, like my parents are still paying. They keep doubling the re- premiums. They're eighty-eight. Like they're barely holding on to keep those premiums going. Like, is it worth it or not? And it's the one thing, assuming Trans America doesn't go out of business, um, that you know, the one great investment, sort of like buying, like you know. You know, by, buying uh, Amazon early on was like locking in that thing before they took got rid of the one-time pay. 
Yeah, and Transamerica is out of the long-term care insurance business now for new policies. They right. ended it about a decade ago. Because maybe that was maybe when I got it. They, they were the last ones that had that piece. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Those are the types of things that you can do to actually insulate yourself as a small business, small law firm owner, take advantage of opportunities like but, that. But and, we'll, call, uh, we'll kick and, this to another episode, but how do you balance the benefits? I know you love having that. Do you talk about, I'm sure you do, but do you talk about that at every raise and discussion of salary saying, here's your dollar salary, here's your benefits package of value. And you know, is there a situation where I'm making this up, but let's say somebody's benefits package is $15,000 and they're making 65 and they're like, yeah, this is, uh, this is great, but I can get 72 with adequate insurance. And, you know, I, and, and so are there situations where you, you're going to basically benefit yourself out of an employee? Um, yeah, I mean, it's all, it's, it's, it's really a challenge. And and the problem is, is that there's no playbook for this. Like, I mean, I guess corporate America has a playbook for it. Here's our policies. Here's what we do. You get it. And, and there's no wiggle room, that type of thing. But once you get into the once you get into the small business area, you know, you know, and, and the people that are leaving you or staying with you, if they left you um, are probably going to another small business because small businesses, small law firms, we're the people that we we employ, you know, 60, 70 percent of Americans. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a challenge. I have had lawyers leave me for less money, but, you know, state golden plan, health insurance, you know, with no deductible. But how much of it is the insurance and how much of it is they can sit at their desk and waste away till retirement? Well, that too. Could you imagine taking a job at 27 and knowing that you're going to retire at 70 and, uh, that's your, that, you know, you've got a, you've got a, a roadmap from 27 to 70. I look, I, I have a, uh, my mom's cousin, I cousin like once removed who literally sat at a federal agency with a uh, calendar clock on his desk to retirement. Not for it's me. It's not the life for us. Exactly. Well, on it's that note, not, let's, let's, uh, note. let's, uh, let's take it. Let's take him home. So, all right, folks. So thanks for being with us today. If, if you ever want to follow along with us, you can do so by subscribing to the Law Firm Blueprint podcast, or you can catch up with us in our Facebook group, The Law Firm Blueprint. Uh, for this week, I am Jay Ruain. He is Seth Price. Thank you for being with us. Be sure to catch us and give us a five-star review on whatever podcast player you listen to. Stay tuned for us next week when you get another live episode of The Law Firm Blueprint. Bye for now.